You got much better to do. Tantra and working out. A lot of work. Sally, Sally, for certain though, Netflix does know that you're making this film with or without my permission? Like they're aware of this? Yes, they do, yes. 100%. So Netflix is making a movie about my life story before I was arrested, but they refuse to pay me anything for it. Uh huh. Okay, so they know that the film is about me and my personality and my life story, right? Like, they know the film is about me, yes. right? Yes, I do. All right, and they, they have commissioned this film on the basis of it being a documentary about you. If I made a movie about O.J. Simpson's football career, you better believe he'd be making bank off it. And he wrote a book about killing his wife. Bill Cosby got royalties for the Cosby Show, was sitting in prison for rape. And he was raping women from that very show between sets. On his own behalf, if you wish, Mr. McGilvery. Mr. Gil McGilvery, would you like to address the court? Your Honor, I wish to address the court at this time. Would you please rise? Thank you. My name you. is Caleb Lawrence McGilvery. Uh, I am a sound mind and cunning intelligence, as has been declared by this court. I do declare that I do not surrender the Sixth Amendment right to be represented by counsel. I do declare that there is a conflict of interest that exists between Peter Liguori and myself, as has been indicated by an agent of his office, namely John Johnson, in a private meeting as such. I do declare that uh, the Office of the Public Defender of New Jersey has employed somebody who is a named party in the action uh, I have invoked in federal court under the Ku Klux Klan Act, namely 42 U.S.C. 1983 as sequence, and therefore I believe that the Office of the Public Defender cannot represent... To fully understand how my trial testimony was sabotaged, you need the full context. It starts in May of 2013, when I arrived at the Uni County Jail. A lot of the guards there were friends with the cause from Clark. From the moment I arrived, they started exacting revenge against me for allegedly killing a cop's brother. They made me wear a green dress, put me in isolation, and deprived me of sleep for days on end. They took turns standing outside my door all night telling me to kill myself. After three days of isolation and sleep deprivation, I went to general population. The Union County guards continued to knock on my door to wake me every half an hour and tell me to kill myself. Remember, I had just survived an assault on May 12th of 2013 and gone from being everyone's hero to being called every sort of bad thing by the prosecutor. After two months of this, I actually did try to kill myself. When I got back to Union County Jail from the hospital, more of the same psychological torture kept happening. After two more months of this, I tried killing myself again. This time, they put me in the medical isolation for 20 months. It was a shoe unit with so-called health checks every half an hour. The Union County guards went to work on me, taking turns standing outside the door and brainwashing me by saying things purposely designed to fuck with my head and destroy my self-esteem. When I finally got back into general population in 2015, I got the law librarian to print out every form and case I needed to sue the Union County Prosecutor's Office with for destroying evidence and lying about me in the media. But as soon as the Union County guards caught wind of my lawsuit, they doubled down on the sleep deprivation and psychological torture. That's when I prematurely found out about their plan to discredit me at trial. All those months the Union County guards sleep deprived me and brainwashed me were part of their plan to discredit me. They literally drove me crazy. They convinced me I had died and gone to hell, and that the inmates bragging about doing sick shit were somehow me from past lives, and that I had to confess my supposed past lives on the telephone to God. Sure, that doesn't make any sense now, but it would if you only had two hours of sleep a night for months on end. After I sued Union County, the guards there incited an inmate to fight me. They pepper sprayed me then locked me in a cell covered in pepper spray with no shower for days. When I got out of lockup, they wrote an anonymous letter to the psychiatrist claiming I was suicidal. So I got put in medical isolation again. I spent four years in an isolation cell, 23 and a half hours a day. I was never once allowed outside for fresh air that entire time. 
After my lawsuit was stayed, I went back to general population in December of 2017. I trained my mind and body to resist their crazy-making tactics. When Wavy WebServe made a video exposing the Union County Prosecutor's Office, the Union County Guards retaliated by sending me to lockup. But while I was there, I got a serial child molester named Elijah Williams to confess on recording to raping children from the daycares he worked at in Roselle, New Jersey. In the months leading up to trial, the Union County Guards started their sleep deprivation and psychological torture again. But this time, I was prepared. I had disciplined myself with thousands of hours of meditation to withstand their tactics. But the night before I was supposed to testify, an anonymous note appeared again, claiming that I would be killed if I went back to the unit. They sent me to isolation and kept me up all night before I took the stand. You can see in the few pictures that actually exist of trial, the Union County Sheriff officers surrounded me the whole trial looking as though ready for combat. The Sheriff officer gloating at me in the picture of sentencing is looking down his nose at me even though I'm taller than him and standing on a platform. Officers sitting behind me laugh mockingly as I describe waking up to a sexual assault. But when I asked for court or video surveillance to prove the officers were influencing the jury with their body language, the judge refused. Wouldn't you want to see the video? I couldn't figure out why, from jury selection onwards, the black sheriff officers went out of their way to be rude to me, and the white sheriff officers went out of their way to be nice to me in front of the jury. I'm an anti-racist. I stopped an attack by a white supremacist with my hatchet. But it all made sense when the public defender put a guy on stand who bragged about defending three Ku Klux Klansmen who dragged a black man to death behind a pickup truck. They were trying to make me look racist to the black jurors. Half the jury was black. Court TV tried to get news cameras into trial, but the judge refused to allow them. I tried to get the courtroom video surveillance, but the judge refused to let me view them. I even tried to subpoena the supposed court smart audio recordings of head judge Robert Mega's courtroom the day he was seen at the crime scene. But if those recordings even exist, the Union County judges refused to provide them. Does all that give you a reasonable doubt about what was on those recordings? Now that you have a context of the extent to which the Union County Goon Squad went to discredit me, you should know that they also used a practice called trading up. Trading up is when the prosecutor cuts a deal with a news agency like NJ.com to give them the first scoop on the next however many major news stories, so long as the editor at the news agency doesn't publish any negative facts about the prosecutor or judges. No wonder they didn't allow videos of trial. They wanted to control the information that got to the public. The rapist's network of friends included judges, lawyers, and politicians. And you know that if the court admits that he was a rapist, it would look very bad for his network of friends. You know that their networks of friends included judges, lawyers, and politicians across the whole state of New Jersey. So of course they're going to keep calling in favors until they get to a federal court on petition for habeas corpus. It would be nice if the media would expose them, but they make deals to give inside scoops in return for not publishing articles that are negative about themselves. Judges, lawyers, and politicians, like those who are friends with the rapist, develop large networks of other judges, lawyers, and politicians over the course of years in college, business, and working in the legal system. They build up a list of favors they do for people in their network, and when they need to call in a favor, sometimes they call multiple people at once. In my case, many friends of the rapist must have called in many favors at once, just in time for the Netflix movie. The timing of the appellate decision affirming the false conviction was no accident. Netflix starts filming in a month and releases their movie about me at the same time that the New Jersey Supreme Court decides whether to let me appeal to them. They're trying to use Netflix as propaganda to stop me from exposing the corruption of several New Jersey judges, prosecutors, and law enforcement officers. They figure that by the time I get to federal court with my appeals, the public will be saturated with a movie saying that the false conviction was affirmed. This is clearly a case of them manipulating the media. If you doubt that this behind-closed-doors cover-up by the prosecution and the media happens on the regular, look at Bill Cosby. The prosecutor refused to prosecute him, and the media refused to report on him. Same with Harvey Weinstein. Same with Jeffrey Epstein. Those three aren't the only ones to do that kind of thing. But all three used trading up to bribe reporters with inside scoops not to report negative facts. All three called in favors to stop investigations, and all three were disgusting serial rapists. You 
could call it a conspiracy, but that brings to mind UFOs and JFK. This is a systematic abuse of power by a small group of individuals working together and using their network of connections to avoid the shame of being exposed to the public for enabling a rapist to prey upon vagrants for half a century. This is very real. This is not a conspiracy theory. You've already seen this happen with Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, and Bill Cosby. It's happening right here, right now, for real. If I'm up against a network of well-connected judges and lawyers who are admitted friends of the dead rapist and who are pulling strings with their own network of judges and lawyers stretching across the state of New Jersey, my only chance might be to get to a federal court where they don't have as many connections. That means I may have to fight up to seven more years for the U.S. Supreme Court to tell them they can't destroy evidence, then make me prove my innocence. That's against the Constitution. That so-called trial is nothing but a carefully crafted cover-up by the Union County Judiciary, Prosecutor, and Public Defender's Office. That creep rapist was friends with the head judge, the head prosecutor, and the mayor. He was president of the Clark Police Union, and his brother was the chief of police. There's no possible way he could get a fair trial in that county. They weren't interested in justice. They were interested in revenge against me for killing their buddy. I was used to people inviting me home after my video. A random Bill Cosby type invited me to his house. I drank beer, went to bed in the guest room, I woke up with what I thought was drool on my face. I went to meet a friend who didn't show, and I called the Cosby type for a place to stay. He drove my drink early because he had work the next day. I woke up being assaulted and fought from underneath. My PTSD kicked in, and I lost a chunk of time. I didn't know he died until I was arrested. But after the second night, I realized it wasn't drool the first night. This horrific saga didn't start with me. Fifty years ago, Joseph Galfi was a military judge in West Germany. His brother James was a military policeman. This was during the Cold War, so Joseph Galfi prosecuted homosexuals and Soviet spies, despite being homosexual himself. Both Joseph and James hid this fact from their superiors, but did they hide it from the Soviet spies that they court-martialed? James Galfi blurted out in a police interview that Joseph Galfi was allegedly robbed by a vagrant at his parents' posh shore house in the 70s. James was a local cop at the time, so if a vagrant called the cops and said Joseph drugged and raped him, whoever responded knew the family. Whose side do you think the cops would take? A vagrant or a cop's brother? Just because James Galfi may have covered up Joseph's secrets in the 70s, does that mean he kept covering up for his brother even 50 years later? Well, I published a letter that shows that James used money from Joseph's estate to create a conflict of interest so the drug effect expert Robert Pandina couldn't testify. Pandina stated that my symptoms matched the most common rape drugs, like GHB. The prosecutor said they didn't, but Pandina couldn't testify because of James Galfi. But what about the other cops in Clark? Joseph Galfi was a past president of the Clark Police Union. According to Robert Mega, the first responding officer to the scene was an actual law client of Joseph Galfi. According to Richard DiCaprio, the officer regularly had lunch with Joseph. How about all the other Clark Police officers at the crime scene where evidence of rape was destroyed? You think they might have been clients of Joseph Galfi too? Some of the evidence the investigators destroyed was the carpet the rape happened on with the urine stain under the rapist's face. They could have tested that urine from the carpet fibers for drug metabolites. Remember, this was never a rape trial. If there's a reasonable doubt that there's drugs in the urine, they're supposed to presume I'm innocent of homicide versus the rapist. They also destroyed the drinking glasses from the kitchen and pill bottles from the fridge. But who destroyed the evidence? Crime scene photos show the dishwasher was run after the cop seized the house. James Galfi is shown on a news video sitting in his car while an investigator broke the crime scene tape and went in to grab funeral clothes. But wait, the Clark Police didn't write that in their logbook. Even the Union County Sheriff said that the crime scene was sealed and that no one broke the tape. But the video shows that's false, so who else was allowed into the act of crime scene? The medical examiner, Junaid Sheikh, said that he recognized head judge Robert Mega at the crime scene. Judge Mega was law partners with the rapist. Their firm represented at least one of the responding officers, so it stands to reason that he and his clients didn't want to be associated with rape. 
But Mega said court smart records show he was at the courthouse a half hour away until four that afternoon. So he says, how could the medical examiner see him at five o'clock at the crime scene? Judge Vega was called to testify at a hearing to move the trial to a different county. Well in advance, had Judge Regina Caulfield broke a judicial code by warning Mega to find a lookalike. They both relied on court smart records to say he wasn't there. But I filed subpoenas for those records and they won't provide them. The thing is, who even believes he wouldn't stop at his buddy's house, which is only five minutes away from his own, especially when half the cops at the scene are their clients? So that's at least two judges, but then the head prosecutor, Theodore Romanko, admitted during a press release that he was in the same circles as a rapist. However, instead of letting someone else take over the investigation, he vouched for his buddy and painted a real bad picture of me in the media. Then, he supervised the investigators who destroyed evidence, then promptly resigned after. I wonder what kind of circles those were. Lewis William Conrad III, anyone? There are a few creeps on comment boards posting a bunch of rape myths, like he was dressed like he was asking for it, or once they're raped, they're all hookers anyways. And to them I say, save that shit for the rape trials. The rapist is dead. I'm supposed to be innocent unless proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So if there's a reasonable doubt that I defended myself against a sexual assault, I should be exonerated. I shouldn't have to prove anything, least of all the creeps like that. They refused to move the trial to a different county, and the judge at the trial was obviously friends with the other judges in that county. Now, he wasted no time banning video cameras at trial, so few noticed in jury selection when he excluded all jurors who had been or who had family who had been sexually assaulted, but he refused to exclude any jurors who had been accused of or had family accused of sexual assault. Does that sound fair to you? The prosecutor accused me of ambushing the rapist, knocking him down, and stomping him out for no reason at all. The biggest problem with that is when you knock someone down, they fall in the direction you knock them. When you hit something, it moves backwards. He was on the carpet facing away from a small bedside cabinet I can't possibly fit in, and his injuries were to the front. No furniture was knocked around, but he must have been knocked backwards repeatedly towards the ceiling. During trial, my public defender refused to object to the prosecutor doing serious things, like pointing to the wrong part of a chest x-ray with a laser pointer thereby fooling the jury about the location of the injuries. There's a big difference between a kick to the side and a kick to the sternum. A kick to the sternum means I was kicking up from underneath. Could you see how the location of the kick could make a big difference in the verdict? I really started to question whether my public defender was really on my side when he abruptly told me at the last minute that my supposed crime scene expert was actually a handwriting expert. But I had serious doubts after the so-called expert started bragging to the half-black jury that he had proudly defended three Ku Klux Klansmen who dragged a black man to death behind a pickup truck. You can imagine their reactions as he sneered and swaggered at them from the witness stand. The public defender left no doubt he was against me during closing arguments. I want to read his exact words from the actual transcript using his exact delivery. I'm going to go over some of the stuff that the state's going to say, well, the shows my client is full of crap. He did this intentionally. He purposely ran out of the house. He hid his appearance. They're going to say that he cut his hair, but the transcript doesn't show that. No wonder they banned cameras at trial. Judge Robert Kirsch chewed me out before I took a stand. and was extremely hostile toward me throughout my entire testimony. Of course, there are no video cameras to record his sneers and hostile body language, because he threatened to put anyone who took videos of trial in jail for contempt. But you can imagine how his obvious contempt for me affected the jurors when he treated every other witness like their testimony actually mattered. Judge Kirsch decided the jury wasn't allowed to infer that evidence destroyed by the investigators might have shown him telling the truth. This evidence included pill bottles, drinking glasses, and the carpet the rape happened on. Then he told the jury that the burden of proving intoxication was on me to prove by clear and convincing evidence. Evidence that the investigators destroyed. So how am I supposed to do that? Judge Kirsch used a loophole to make it guilty until proven innocent. In New Jersey, the defense of involuntary intoxication will acquit you, but the defendant has to prove it by clear and convincing evidence. However, 
the fact of intoxication as it relates to the defense of self-defense is still supposed to be on the prosecutor to disprove intoxication. Except in my case, Kirsch told the jury that I had to prove intoxication, period. Considering that the whole case is that I woke up on the floor after being drugged and fought off a sexual assault, telling the jury I have to prove I was drugged is the same thing as telling them I have to prove my case. How come only rapists get to be innocent until proven guilty? But if you kill a rapist in self-defense, you have to prove your innocence. You call that justice? Most people don't realize that 7 out of 8 rapists beat their charges and are presumed innocent. That's why only 1 in 19 rapes gets reported. That's why only 1 in 143 rapes ends in a conviction. That's why 1 in 20 American men and 1 in 4 American women get raped in their lifetime. But did you realize that using deadly force to stop a sexual assault, even the threat of a sexual assault, is supposed to be legal in New Jersey? They told people the jury didn't believe me because people are used to when a rape survivor isn't believed, the rapist is presumed innocent. But this was never a rape trial. The rapist is dead. This was a homicide trial. Self-defense against rape is a right. But they told the jury that the burden was on me to prove intoxication and rape by clear and convincing evidence. But I deserve the same presumption of innocence unless proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt that's given to the 7 out of 8 rapists that beat their charges and walk free. The prosecutor told people that I cut my hair afterwards to change my appearance. But there is physical evidence that I cut my hair well before anything even happened. There is also video surveillance from New Jersey Transit of me with short hair earlier that day. But the investigators deliberately destroyed it because it didn't match their fake story. But I published crime scene photos that show my recently cut hair in a place that proves I'm telling the truth. Crime scene photos show short, recently cut dark hair on the side surface of the bed. Not the top surface, the side surface. That means my head was pushed into the side surface, which is only three feet off the ground. I say pushed because the same short dark hair was found on the rapist's palms. I'm six feet tall. The only time my head is three feet off the ground is when I just sat up. So there's physical evidence that my hair was already cut when I woke up, sat up, and was pushed into the side surface of the bed. The short dark hair in the rapist's palms on the side of the bed had to be mine because the rapist's hair was gray. It also shows that he was over top of me and on my left side when I started hitting him. That's why all his injuries were to his front right side, even though he was found face down. There were no bruises to his back to support the prosecutor's claim of standing behind him and pulling his neck back, but his neck was broken in three places from snapping backwards, and his skull was fractured from three frontal blows, all upwards from underneath him. The medical examiner said that the rapist's ear was almost torn off from a single kick. He testified that the tearing was caused by the rough fabric of the denim jeans scraping the side of the rapist's head during the kick. Bloody footprints showed that my jeans were down and under the heel of my right foot, and the denim under that heel was soaked in blood. So that proves I kicked his ear with my right heel. But if I were standing and kicking downwards, the skull around his ear would have fractured. Instead, the medical examiner said that the kick was horizontal, which proves that I was on the floor on my back. There is a large wet stain under the rapist's body, with a rag he was gripping near his right hand. The edges of the stain are red with blood, but the stain underneath his chest was just wet, without any red. The sheriff lied and said it was all blood, but ask any honest crime scene expert and they'll tell you the blood stains are red. I think the rapist was trying to wash me off with the rag, but the water woke me up. When he slammed into me, I pissed myself out of fear, but if they... The urine stain under the rapist shows that I couldn't have been standing over top of him and pissing on him. It starts to steer his solar plexus, which was under his face down body. In fact, it shows my path as I struggled out from underneath him, moving in a J shape away from directly under him and ending with me kicking him away from me, from on my back. The urine stain proves self-defense because not only was I underneath him, I was terrified enough to piss myself out of fear. The urine stain proves more than self-defense. It proves that he drugged my drink. As anyone who's ever done a drug test for work knows, if you pee in a cup, someone can test your urine for drugs. GHB can only be detected for 8 to 10 hours after ingestion, but I pissed myself on the carpet only a few hours after drinking the beer. There was so much urine in the carpet that they could have cut out the stain, squeezed the urine into a cup, and tested it for drugs. But they didn't.
My birth parents said I had a demon when I was two and three and four years old. But a four-year-old who wakes up screaming from night terrors four to five nights a week, randomly freaks out in public, and has to go to the doctor with a prolapsed colon, doesn't have a demon, he has PTSD. From what though? I, I guess I'll never know because they ain't telling. From when I was two years old, both my birth parents took turns beating me and throwing me in a freezing cold shower when I woke up screaming from night terrors. So when I was a small child and my hamster Hammy made noise at night, I was scared they might beat him, so I gave him a cold shower in the sink. He died of pneumonia. After my second hamster died like that, I realized that cold showers killed them. I, I never gave any of my furry friends cold showers again after that. My stepmother, Lenora, used to chase me around, trying to beat me or cut me with sharp knives when I was six and seven and eight years old. I would barricade myself in a room, call 911, but when the cops came, Lenora would pretend to be normal, and her and Gil would explain to the cops that I had behavioral problems. The cops wouldn't ask me anything because Lenora and Gil said I was crazy. They just left it, and, and it kept happening for years. Gil and Lenora used to buy me porn magazines and watch softcore with me when, when I was a small child. They told me to have sex with my stepsister when I was only seven years old, as they had loud sex in the next room as we did. They got me to have sex with all the girls in my class when I was in elementary school. Then when social services got involved, they blamed it all on me and said I watched too much TV. Would you trust them to babysit? My foster parents never once abused me or anyone else. Nick and Aggie were the wisest, kindest people on earth. And I will always be grateful to them for providing a great example of how people should be. They sacrificed a lot to provide a safe and loving home to kids. On their farm, they taught me the value of hard work and community spirit. The world needs more people like them. I know I will always cherish the years I spent with them. I moved out of my foster home when I was 15 years old and got a job. When I was 16 years old, I went hitchhiking to BC. I was working construction in the day and serenading French Canadian women at night by the beach. Then one day, I found Jesus. I read in the Bible that to be saved, you have to give away everything and renounce everyone and travel to preach the gospel. So that's what I did. I dropped so much weight from fasting and praying that I looked like a Holocaust survivor. I was happy. When I was an emaciated, homeless 17-year-old, I was brutally assaulted in the forest for hours. I escaped by running naked through dense thorn bushes, jumping off a cliff and throwing myself in front of a car on a highway to make him stop and call 911. After the cops and paramedics got there, I can't remember anything until I was at the hospital talking to a doctor, but the judge at trial wouldn't let me say anything to the jury about that incident and my PTSD from it. When I got back to Alberta at 17 years old, I was a shattered person. But my mentor, John Reed, gave me a construction job and helped me rebuild my life. He worked with my foster parents, my camp counselors, and the local American Indian Friendship Center to help me finish my high school diploma and get into college. Even though I dropped out to work construction and travel around with my guitar, that experience of a loving community totally replaced my traumatic upbringing with a firm foundation. I appreciate that. Going to festivals and living in hippie communes while traveling inspired me to work and make my dreams a reality. I was on my way to West Vancouver Island to go surfing when I was assaulted at 17. So at 22 years old, I worked construction all year to save up cash, then moved at 23 to live in my van in the rainforest and surf all day. I did that for a year. Then when my money ran out and my van broke down, I crossed the border and hitchhiked to California for an endless summer. One person made a Facebook post saying that I was disrespectful to women, but what she really meant was that if I didn't do exactly what she wanted, then she called me disrespectful, and then she claimed to represent all women everywhere. I said I cleaved a motherfucker's head wide open to save women in front of a school bus full of kids, but I questioned who was the worst example for children, me for telling her in front of kids to stop being a fucking jackass, or her for being a fucking jackass in front of kids. People ask me why I pissed on the Walk of Fame, and they just don't realize how much acid I dropped before the producers of the Kardashians picked me up. I was still tripping and drunk on Jack when security kicked me out of the Hollywood Roosevelt for skateboarding in the lobby. 
It was after dark and all the kids had gone home. It just made sense to shower gold on a star after that. It would make sense to you too after four quarts of LSD and a bottle of Jack Daniels. But I gave away everything I owned to the poor afterwards, so that makes it better, right? Jana Pruden published an article about me in the Globe and Mail in June of 2020 using screenshots of a Facebook comment to flame me as disrespectful to women and swearing in front of kids. On her cover photo, Jana put three bullet holes in my neck next to three checkboxes. Those checkboxes are only there to remind me of a conversation I had with Jana, and the bullet holes are her message to me that she's character is Jana Pruden published an article about me in the Globe and Mail in June of 2020 using screenshots of a Facebook comment to flame me as disrespectful to women and swearing in front of kids. On her cover photo, Jana put three bullet holes in my neck next to three checkboxes. Those checkboxes are only there to remind me of a conversation I had with Jana, and the bullet holes are her message to me that she's character assassinating me because of that conversation. A picture is worth a thousand words. When Jana interviewed me in May of 2019, she asked me how I was coping with the false conviction. I told her that I made checklists of things I needed to get done. Because focusing on my checklist kept me from getting overwhelmed during that devastating time. The conversation turned to traveling, and she told me about when she went to Africa. That's where the three bullet holes come in. You should always watch what you say to a reporter with a humongous ego. Go ahead and ask me how I know. Jana told me that while she was in Africa, she heard a radio program of someone reading a book. She thought the book described an adventurous journalist, so right then and there, she decided to pursue a career in journalism. She was laughing as she told me that she later bought the book and found out that it said something completely different than what she heard. But when I said, hey, isn't that a Mondegreen? She abruptly stopped laughing, got really tense, and hung up shortly after. That's where I fucked up. Jana got revenge against me in her article by saying people turned against me after I got my neck tattooed. Hello bullet holes. She used a Facebook post as an example, but left out the part where scores of women who knew me, and knowing full of respect, told the poster to take down the bullshit. The poster did take it down, but Jana found a screenshot of it and put it back up in the Globe and Mail. Jana felt disrespected by the word Mondegreen, so she tried to make people see me the way she did. I thought journalists loved words, so I'd hoped Jana would be delighted by the word Mondegreen. I didn't realize she would instead look at it as reducing the most pivotal experience of her life to a trite aphorism. I didn't realize she'd obsessed about it for the next year. I didn't realize she'd taunt me with three checkboxes next to three bullet holes she put on my neck in an article character assassinating me. But what else can you expect from someone who based her whole life on something she heard wrong? When Todd Grande mocked single mothers in poor neighborhoods, blasting their way out of poverty, he was telling them it's their fault, that their poverty is the reason sexually violent predators target their children. He thinks people are stupid for calling an axe-wielding defender of women a hero. He pompously picks up PTSD survivors as mentally ill, and people pay him for mocking the mothers of sexually abused children, and he takes that money to Thailand, and he spends it at Phuket. What's wrong with that picture? The Union County jail guards were convicted of raping young inmates. Google Gayland Robinson. The Union County judges were caught forcing young defendants to either fuck them or go to prison. Google James Boyland Sr. The Union County prosecutor's office said Joseph Galf was in the same circles as those creeps who were responsible for sexually abusing thousands of young inmates at the Union County Edna Mahon facility. Google Edna Mahon sex abuse. I don't understand why anybody would sympathize with those creeps who disrespect thousands of rape survivors. Union County Prosecutor Theodore Romankow said during a press release that he was in the same circles as rapist Joseph Galfi. He then admitted on camera that something of a sexual nature happened, but he called it consensual. If you knew who else was in those circles, you know those circles called rape consensual, then slap each other's wrists for raping the vulnerable and molesting children. I'm going to introduce you to some of Galfi Romanko's circles, but keep in mind these are only the few that got caught. Before you wonder why they don't lose their license to practice law, the New Jersey Supreme Court held in a matter of Mark G. Legato in 2017 that the court refrains from establishing a rule requiring disbarment in all cases involving sexual offenses against children. Those are their exact words. Mark Legato sexually abused 12-year-olds he met online, but he didn't lose his bar license permanently. He's not the only one. I'll introduce you to more of Galfin Romanco's circles, and you can see what I mean. 
Galaxy Romanco circles included Stephen Allen Herman, whose wrist was slapped with a three-year suspension in 1987 for repeatedly sexually assaulting a ten-year-old boy. They included Jeffrey P. Wright, who got his wrist slapped with a two-year suspension in 1992 for molesting several prepubescent boys. They slapped James W. Kennedy's wrist with six months in 2003 for molesting kids, but a lawyer named Pierce from Galaxy Romanco circles got off with only a reprimand in 1995 for exposing his genitals to a 12-year-old child. The Alfino Romanco circles included Deputy Attorney General Joseph J. Haldusiewicz, who only got six months suspension when he got caught with 996 images of small child porn on his prosecutor's office computer in 2005. Same with Donald S. Rosanelli in 2003 and Frank L. R. Moore in 2006. The Alfino Romanco circles included Assemblyman Neil Cohen, who got his wrist slapped with a five-year suspension in 2011 for distributing child porn from his office in the New Jersey State Legislature. James F. Boylan was a judge in Galaxy Romanco circles who forced defendants to have sex with him and go to jail. He helped his son Ryan Boylan to avoid jail time for molesting a five-year-old. Union County Head Judge Robert Nagel is on Galaxy speed dial, and Judge Regina Caulfield helped Nagel cover up his involvement. Ronald Sears Nagel was reprimanded for cruelty and neglect of a child in 2017, and Judge Antonio Inacio from the same town of Clark, where Galaxy Romanco, Nagel, and Caulfield all practice law, got off with only a reprimand in 2015. Slap those judges' wrists. Galfi Norenko circles included cops too. Officer Gaylor Robinson forcibly raped inmate Jesse Collins at the Union County Jail in 1991, but he never did any jail time for that. An inmate had to use a paternity test to prove Officer Joseph M. Spann raped her in 1989. Jacqueline Hegenmiller was repeatedly raped by a cop from Galfi Norenko circles at the Edna Mayhaw facility in 1995, but it wasn't until 25 years and thousands of rapes later that a class action lawsuit exposed Galfi Norenko circles at the Edna Mayhaw facility. Galfin Romanco Circles helped cover up Union County Jail Guards Kevin and Kenneth Burker's sexual abuse of females in 2017. They helped cover up Officer Joey Garcia, who made an incontinent paraplegic sit and piss and shit in a wheelchair for days, then threw the inmate's Koran into the hallway and made him crawl to pick it up before he got a shower. The inmate had to hold himself up in the shower, naked and covered in bed sores, while Officer Joey Garcia watched and laughed and made fun of the inmate's penis. That's sadistic sexual abuse. Theodore Romancow and Joseph Galfi were in the same circles as cops, judges, and lawyers who rape inmates, who molest little kids, and who distribute child pornography from the prosecutor's office computer. They slap each other's wrists for all that, and those are only the ones who got caught. Those are only the ones who are the tip of the iceberg. For every one they can't deny, there's ten they cover up. And it's going to keep going like that until people require the same screenings for state government officials that the federal government requires from theirs. That's fucking crazy. Hi, I'm going to tell you what's being done to get me out of prison. But first, I'll get you up to speed on my case so far. I spent six years in county jail waiting for trial. During that time, I learned law and attempted to file motions to represent myself. But I was forced to go to trial with a lawyer who worked against me. I filed my own briefs on appeal, which I wrote myself. And now I'm in federal court petitioning for a writ of habeas corpus. The Federal Writ of Habeas Corpus is an order by a federal court to release a prisoner, which is made because a state government is holding him in violation of the American Constitution. Habeas Corpus is meant to protect our constitutional rights from unlawful state government actions. Ever since Bill Clinton passed the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act in 1996, habeas has become extremely hard to get, unless the AEDPA doesn't apply to your case. Luckily for me, the AEDPA doesn't apply in my case. In order for it to apply, the state court must adjudicate the merits of my constitutional claims. This means they must apply the law to the facts of my case. If the state court tries to rely on state law technicalities, it removes the barriers of AEDPA. In my case, the New Jersey Appellate Court relied on procedural missteps, whatever that means, which removes AEDPA's barriers. My constitutional claims are my Sixth Amendment right to represent myself and my Fifth Amendment right to due process, which means the trial procedure was unconstitutional because the prosecutor destroyed key evidence. Three months before trial, I tried to fire my useless lawyer and file my own motions to remedy the destruction of evidence, but the trial court forced me to go to trial with that same useless lawyer. The destroyed evidence includes surveillance video showing prosecution witnesses' testimony to be false, drug containers and drinking glasses from the kitchen that were never analyzed for rape drugs, 
and the court that the rape happened on. My argument on habeas corpus is that I could not possibly get a fair trial without this evidence. And the trial court violated my right to file my own motion to remedy the destruction of this evidence. In addition to my habeas petition, I've also filed motions in federal court for an evidentiary hearing about the destroyed evidence, as well as for financial assistance to hire a crime scene and a drug analysis expert to testify at that hearing. You can keep track of my current progress on PACER using the information from the description, and I'll update you every time I file something. My habeas petition will take one to three years to get through the district court to the Third Circuit of Appeals. But this is how Reuben Hurricane Carter got out. He had to make the corrupt state courts accountable to the federal courts to win his freedom. And so do I. If you want to help me in this, there's no guarantee that the court will pay for a crime scene expert. So please donate to my Go Get Funding so I can hire the expert myself and pay for legal costs. The U.S. Supreme Court decided Brady v. Maryland in 1963, and since then, people call this case Brady for short. Brady held that if a prosecution withholds evidence that could prove your innocence, it violates your right to due process of law. A Brady violation is when the prosecution withholds or destroys evidence that could change the outcome of trial in an effort to falsely convict you, just like they did to me. Before jury selection, the trial court decides what questions the jury is asked. When the crowd of people called for jury duty arrives in the courtroom, each juror is asked these questions. Based on their answers, the court will get rid of some jurors on its own, and the defense and prosecution can each use a limited number of strikes to get rid of others. In my case, they excluded all jurors with negative experiences of sexual assault. The Sixth Amendment gives us the right to have a lawyer defend us in court. This is called assistance of counsel. But this right gives us more than just a lawyer. It requires that lawyer to be effective and do a good job. In my case, the lawyer they forced on me purposefully sabotaged my case, called a Ku Klux Klan witness to anger the black jurors, then told the jurors that I was guilty. That's called ineffective assistance of counsel. The 5th and 14th Amendments say that we cannot be deprived of life or liberty without due process of law. The process we are due includes procedures like being given all of the evidence available, being told who the witnesses are, and having the opportunity to show the jury this evidence and these witnesses at trial. If you're deprived of that evidence, those witnesses, or that opportunity, you're deprived of due process. The Sixth Amendment gives you a right to a speedy and public trial. This is to protect you from being held in jail for years until people forget about you, then put on trial behind closed doors without public accountability. In my case, they held me in jail for six years, then banned video cameras from the courtroom. They did this so that support for me would fade and the public would be kept in the dark about what happened in the courtroom. An indictment is when the prosecutor presents evidence of a crime to a grand jury, and that jury decides there is enough evidence to press charges. A grand jury is different than a jury at trial, which is called a petit jury, because a jury at trial decides whether you did it, but the grand jury decides whether you could be charged. If the evidence given to the grand jury is false, the trial verdict can be thrown out. That's why the prosecutor had to get a new indictment, because he gave false evidence. Federal courts refuse to interfere with state court decisions unless the prisoner has given the state court system a fair chance to review the decision and to fix the problem. Giving this chance is called exhaustion, and reviewing to fix is called remedies. Sneaky public defense lawyers often work with the prosecutor to leave important problems out of direct appeal, so that the prisoner has to spend an average of five to ten years exhausting his remedies on PCR before federal courts will review a decision. Luckily, I represented myself on direct appeal, so my remedies are already exhausted. A prosecutor is supposed to conduct themselves with honor and integrity as an officer of the law. If they don't, and instead destroy evidence, deceive the jurors, make unfair comments that are meant to manipulate the jurors' emotions, and other low-handed tactics, like they did in my case, that's called prosecutorial misconduct and violates your constitutional right to a fair trial. It happens a lot in New Jersey, but prosecutors never get in trouble for it.
You have a right under the Sixth Amendment to have trial before an impartial judge. But when a judge has a personal vendetta or is friends with someone who does, that judge has what's called judicial bias. Judge Robert Kirsch admitted to obsessively watching hundreds of videos of me and expressed a bitter jealousy and hatred of me. His supervisor was close friends of the rapist. He's an example of both kinds of judicial bias, but judges never get in trouble for it. Federal courts are divided into district courts and court of appeals. The district courts hold evidentiary hearings, which are like many trials where evidence and witness testimony are introduced and facts are developed. They make rulings of law on those facts, which are then reviewed by the court of appeals. If the court of appeals decides that the district's ruling was wrong, they change it to make it right. Sometimes evidence is presented that requires an expert to explain the significance of it. The Constitution requires state courts to provide defendants with an expert witness who can explain their evidence to the jury. I repeatedly asked for years for experts to testify about the effect of rape drugs and about how my urine in the carpet under the rapist's chest and face could be analyzed for drugs, but they refused to provide one. Racial bias is when the prosecution uses a person's race to turn the jury against them. This violates your constitutional right to a fair trial. In my case, the majority of the jury were people of color. The black sheriff officers used hostile body language towards me, while the white sheriff officers acted sympathetic. Then the defense counsel called only one witness, who openly admitted to defending Ku Klux Klan lynchings. When one of the people in a court action destroys evidence to gain an unfair advantage, the court usually instructs the jury that they can infer that evidence would have been adverse or harmful to the person that destroyed its case. This is called the adverse inference instruction. In my case, the court refused to give the adverse inference instruction even after the prosecutor destroyed all evidence of rape drugs and sexual assault. In New Jersey, you can't be guilty of a crime if you are involuntarily intoxicated when it allegedly happened. That means somebody slipped something in your drink. But if you ask for the jury instruction on involuntary intoxication, the judge will tell the jury that the burden of proving involuntary intoxication is on the defendant. However, the judge is supposed to follow that up by saying that the burden is on the prosecutor to prove there wasn't intoxication per se. But in my case, they didn't. If you kill someone in self-defense, in New Jersey the killing is justified, and you are innocent. But you have to use reasonable force, and you have a duty to retreat if at all possible. You can use deadly force to defend against sexual assault. In my case, the prosecutor destroyed evidence of rape drugs and sexual assault, then deceived the jury into thinking the injuries came from above instead of underneath, which would approve self-defense. When one side of a court action is expected to carry the weight of proving their side of the story, that person has what's called the burden of proof. In a criminal trial, the burden of proof is always supposed to be on the prosecutor. But in my case, the defense counsel worked with the prosecutor and the judge to use tricky words to switch the burden of proof onto me to prove my innocence. The Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, or AEDPA, was created in 1996 to make habeas corpus extremely hard to get. Under the AEDPA, even innocent people like me can't get relief from federal courts if the state courts adjudicated our case on the merits. An adjudication on the merits is when the court applies the law to the facts of your case. Thankfully, the state court ignored the law instead of applying it to my case, so AEDPA doesn't apply to me. A brief is a document that contains facts and law in support of your request that the court take a certain action. You have to show evidence in the record that supports your facts and list the cases in law from courts who've made decisions involving similar facts. Most courts require you to format your briefs very precisely and include table of contents and alphabetical legal authorities. A typical brief takes 20 to 30 hours to research and write. The U.S. Supreme Court decided in a case called Heck v. Humphrey that prisoners cannot use a civil lawsuit to invalidate their criminal conviction. This means that if you sue the prosecutor for destroying evidence or your public defender for accepting bribes, the federal court will dismiss your lawsuit until your conviction is overturned. When this happens, it's called being Heck barred.
All courts have rules that give you a certain amount of time for filing papers. If you don't file your papers within time, you may lose your chance to overturn your conviction forever. Sometimes if an official, like one of the rapist friends in my case, has a lot of hate for a prisoner, they work with their connections in the prison to set the prisoner up for fights or to go to lockup so that the prisoner misses his filing deadlines and gets stuck in prison. That's what it look like now, I'm starting to show you. I practice thousands of hours of tantra too, so it's well rounded. That's how to do a full shot.